This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Sego, Skanagoa. Um, my name is Ben Paulus, as mentioned. I'm a member of the Wolf Clan of the Ganyakahaga or Mohawk Nation. And uh, first off, I want to start off by acknowledging and, and thanking our Chumash relatives for uh, not only honoring us, but honoring all of us here um, and hosting us today in their, in their territory. Um, so as mentioned, I, I do work with uh, number of different groups, Indigenous Environmental Network, Defenders of Land, do work with uh, youth groups in Canada as well, um, and have worked at uh, United Nations level um, for the past number of years um, with different Indigenous organizations from around the world. And so I'll be drawing a little bit from all of those different experiences as well as a little bit from my own academic um, past studying uh, Indigenous peoples, uh, climate change and human rights uh, at Carleton University in Canada. And I also wanted to, to, to briefly mention that our, my people, Mohawk, um, part of the Iroquois Confederacy, were also originally uh, on the coast uh, all the way up to New York State uh, before there was a little incident. You guys probably studied the American Revolution, uh, <laughs> pushed our people up to Canada, north of the border, um, because we were allied with the British at the time, which was apparently a bad thing to do. So. Um, <laughs> I apologize, I'm, I'm a little bit tired today. Um, climate change almost kept me from participating in this conference. Um, I flew in from Ottawa via Toronto yesterday and the entire northeast of North America got hit by just a freak um, combination of frozen ice pellets, freezing rain, snow, slush, and the combined wrath of the gods. And my first flight had to turn around. They, they couldn't even land in, in Toronto. We sat around for a few hours. I missed my connection. Um, and I only got in about midnight last night here. So it's good to be here. <laughs> um, so as mentioned, I'm going to be talking a bit about um, Indigenous peoples, um, trying to ground the experience of, of, of different Indigenous realities. Um, and how Indigenous peoples are impacted by not just climate change itself and sea level rise, which we will talk about, but also the drivers of climate change, as well as impacted by what are being put forward as solutions to climate change and trying to sort of build an understanding of how all those things um, come to overlap. Um, so I'm going to focus the first part of my talk on two different experiences, two different places. Um, that I think really helped to ground us, really helped to, to, to demonstrate some of those realities. Um, also because, you know, they're some of the most extreme examples, but some of the most informative, some of the most illustrative um, places to, to look at. And can you advance the slide? Oh, this one, okay. The first uh, place I'll be talking about is um, Bagua uh, in, the, in the Peruvian Amazon. How many people here have heard of Bagua in this room? One, two, two? Well, what happened in Bagua was a result of a free trade agreement that the United States signed with Peru, which, you know, probably most people in this room are equally unaware of. Being so inconsequential for you know the United States, it meant everything to the lives of a number of, of Peruvians. I happened to be in, in Peru in, in 2009 when the, the the free trade agreement was signed. At the time, there was a, a massive indigenous gathering of about 4,000 people uh, gathered in north of Peru. And just as I was supposed to leave, we learned about this incident going on in in the, sorry in the, in the north of Peru in the Amazon, um, where a, num a number of people had been killed in. Uh, disputes and in, in altercations uh, between indigenous Amazonian protesters and government forces. 
And it was a very, very unclear situation at the beginning. Um, and I ended up getting st almost stuck in the country. Um, my flight got canceled out of the country. And so I ended up um, visiting and, and, and doing some work with some of the indigenous organizations in the area who I had some, some contacts with as a result of that conference. And so I got in touch with them. And the, the initial days after the, the sort of incident happened, um, were a very, very tumultuous time, were very uh, much time of, of widespread confusion um, and fear um, because a lot of the indigenous communities were expecting the, the government to continue um, intervening in their communities. And the, a lot of the, the, the government had basically issued arrest warrants for a number of the indigenous leaders all across the country. And so uh, a lot of us were very sort of concerned in those, in those first few days when, without really you know, necessarily even knowing the full extent of what happened, because at the time as well, besides a few pictures I'm showing you, these are not my photos. The rest of them after these, these series of photos are all mine. Um, after the, the, besides a few pictures that got leaked out, uh, the entire media story, the entire, you know, narrative was be very much controlled by the military and by the government at the time. And the president, you know, was using his power to go on, you know, national media and say that, you know, because of the terrorism, because of the extremism, because of the barbarity of these savages in the Amazon, they are trying to stop our progress. They attacked our people. They attacked our military. They attacked our, you know, forces. We had to go in and, and protect ourselves and protect, you know, Peruvian democracy, the Peruvian state. And of course, we knew that, you know, that wasn't true. That wasn't the real narrative. And so, with a little bit of support from from NGOs and, and also from universities. Um, I was asked to go down and, and with a delegation that included some chiefs as well as other media representatives um, to actually go and, and find out a little bit about you know, what had actually happened in the area. And so we actually traveled down into the Amazon and um, spent about a week there trying to basically figure out, trying to reconstruct a little bit of what had actually occurred. And our task was made very difficult by the government who had gone in in the, you know, the, the days afterwards, after the incident, and basically sanitized the area. So where the actual conflict had taken place was maintained as a sort of completely cordoned off zone. The entire area was under military curfew. Uh, we had to stay, you know, a few towns over and, and travel in um, so that we wouldn't be affected by that, that curfew. Um, when we arrived to, you know, the, the, the main community, uh, which is a mix of an indigenous and non-indigenous community right on the sort of outskirts of the Amazon. Um, you know, it was very hard to find anybody, uh, actual witnesses who had been there because what the government had done was also ship uh, a lot of the indigenous villagers back to their, their communities, basically by force. The only ones who remained um, were either in jail or in the hospital. And so we did travel and we did meet and talk to them and begin to, you know, piece together a few, a few bits of um, what had happened. And one of the most actually incredible things was a little bit of the, the solidarity. Um, so I'll just go back to the last slide for a second. Um, this was the, the police station in, in the town itself. Um, this is one of the most sort of inspiring moments there. But when the, when, when the non-Indigenous villagers here had found out what was happening to their brothers and sisters, that they were under attack, you know, just, just outside of town at, the, at the, the protest site that they had set up, they actually rallied in the town and, and surrounded the police station and, you know, were, were very sort of angry at, at what the police were doing. And so this ended up being a, becoming a second zone of conflict as the police responded by getting up on top of their uh, building and firing into the crowd, um, actually killing a number of people and injuring um, children in the area, anybody who happened to be sort of in the area. Very, very sort of extreme uh, response. Uh, and this was the, the actual zone of the conflict. And so you can see actually uh, large parts of it had actually been burnt down completely, uh, making you know, any sort of uh, recovery of any evidence almost impossible. Um, so we decided that to actually learn about what had happened, we had to go into the Amazon, we had to travel a little bit um, visit some of the, the actual villages where people lived. And so we did that and traveled as, as far as we could basically go by road. Um, most of the Amazon commu Amazonian communities are only accessible by boat, um, but there are a number that, you know, on the outskirts of the Amazon that, that, that can be reached by, um, by car, by transit. 
So we traveled to those communities and began, you know, talking to a lot of people who had participated in the protest. It was a, it was a massive protest that had actually occurred over a period of about two months involving about 30,000 of the, the region's uh, indigenous inhabitants out of a total population of about 300,000 people in the area. So almost 10% of the entire population of the Amazon had partaken in, in, this, in this massive protest, which is an, you know, a really incredible sort of sign and testament, especially because many of them came from villages of, of about 100 people. Um, what emerged was a, really an idea of you know, a lot of the senseless violence, a lot of um, sort of betrayed promises by the government um, over, you know, what, what had gone on, what, what had been negotiated between the indigenous groups and the government prior to, to the actual conflict itself. Um, we found out from, from one of the leaders of the indigenous movement that, in fact, they had actually signed an agreement with a, a sort of, you know, a peace agreement with the government um, in the weeks that preceded the, the conflict, basically assuring each side that, you know, nobody, no, no violence would happen to either side. Um, the, you know, the, the government all this whole time was claiming that the indigenous villagers were, were, you know, armed and dangerous. You know, in fact, they had, they had spears, but, you know, that, that hardly really equates to, you know, the government, which had tanks, helicopters, and machine guns um, in their possessions. And so what we learned was that the day before the actual conflict took place, the government, the military had actually sat down and negotiated um, with the indigenous, the protesters who had been maintaining this, this protest and a blockade to you know, take down the blockade for the period of a day and allow you know, traffic to go in and out and after which they'd be allowed to, to carry on with their protest. What instead ha happened was that military forces um, descended upon the protest site at about 6 a.m. just after uh, dawn and what we were told by, by you know, the indigenous folks who were there was that the police um, began opening fire when they were confronted by the, the villagers who, who you know, demanded to know what they were doing. And very soon afterwards, uh, helicopters and uh, armored tanks basically showed up to, to reinforce them and you know, push them back um, many kilometers from, from where they were doing, um, basically you know, completely uh, disrupting and ending the protest. Um, and in the ensuing violence, um, as well as the, the, the violence that carried over into the neighboring city, or the neighboring town, uh, over 30 people lost their lives, including a number of protesters, a number of civilians, as well as a number of police. And so, of course, you know, in the initial outset, you know, there was widespread condemnation within the media, within you know, the, the government, the, the respectable sectors of you know, this violence against police. Um, by you know the indigenous uh, protesters before you know we could actually get some of the story out there, um, but the other thing that we were really interested in was was finding out from a lot of the the native community you know what they had been protesting for what what they understood of this of this um, you know free trade agreement and I found it completely incredible that you know a lot of these villagers have, I think, a much better sense of what's, what's involved in these free trade agreements than probably most Americans, most Canadians, who, you know, uh, ostensibly these are signed on behalf of, because they knew that it would involve more oil extraction, more mining, more toxic waste, um, more deforestation, more poisoning of their rivers. And as if to prove that point, as we were leaving the, the Amazon area, we actually came across this oil spill that, that you're sort of seeing here. Um, you know, taking place live and, you know, a village um, right adjacent to it, you know, trying to find out what had happened, trying to get some answers and, you know, the military came along and, you know, basically forced us out of the area and said that we, we couldn't be there, we couldn't be taking any pictures, we couldn't be interviewing people. Because for the Amazonian, you know, tribes there, you know, this was, and this, this, this kind of development, you know, quote unquote development represented the end of their food systems, the end of their sources of water, the end of their pharmacies, really, you know, their education systems, their culture and their ways of life. And, you know, for us, it was, it was a really profound develop, uh, understanding of how shallow and one-sided, you know, this, this idea and this model of development uh, really is and really was. And so from there, I want to jump ahead to a year later. Oh, sorry, there's a few more pictures here. 
one of the other, the other sort of uh, impacts that came out of this was actually a widespread uh, condemnation eventually of the government by civil society after the, the real story began to get out after you know, the media began to, to, to pick up on you know, what, what the protesters had been saying all along and what you know, couldn't be hidden by the government anymore. There was the biggest protests against the Peruvian government since the end of the, the Fujimori dictatorship. Um, a number of years ago, and so it, and they ended up kicking out the government and forcing the government to retract some of the laws that they had passed um, that were, you know, the most offensive to, to indigenous communities there. So there, there was a bit of a victory there from, you know, the side of the, the protesters and the, um, you know, civil society actually coming and rallying around, uh, you know, in, in supporting uh, indigenous indigenous communities in Peru. Um, where there's often been a very strong and very heavy divide uh, amongst you know civil society groups there, and so you know a bit of a bit of a you know positive story afterwards, but a lot of those communities are still struggling um, to this day to deal with uh, the, the the impacts and the effects, and of course you know uh, mining, oil, forestry companies haven't stopped their their foray uh, into into the Amazon there. So I want to go from there travel from the Amazon up to northern Alberta, almost the exact opposite environment, um, where, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it, most people are familiar with the development of the tar sands. Um, but what you may not realize is that it's, it's, it's right now at this point, it's one of the biggest development projects on the, the face of the planet, um, trying to develop the resources of the third biggest oil deposit on the globe. Um, that's, northern, that's northern Alberta. It's one of the worst environmental hotspots in all of North America, and one of the ones that has, I think, the, the most impact um, of any sort of these developments around the planet, just, just, just in terms of its scale. Has anybody actually been up to, to, to see the tar sands at all? Nobody from here, one person, yeah. And so you begin, you, you, it's only really once you're there that you begin to understand the scale of it, the fact that you can, if, you, if you're flying over it, you can fly for about 30, 40 minutes, even longer, um, and you begin just to, just to cover the area that's been destroyed of you know, the boreal forest, which is part of the biggest forest ecosystem on the entire planet. Um, so I, did a, I was participated in a, in a photo documentary series that took place over a number of weeks between 2010 and 2011, um, visiting a number of different indigenous communities, trying to understand you know, how some of them were being impacted. And the first, one of the first communities I impacted, uh, or I visited here, was Fort Mackay, uh, which these pictures are from. And you know, what actually looks like a lake is actually a pool of toxic chemicals, almost a meter, or sorry, a, a mile wide and three miles long, um, in the backyard of, of one of the native communities there, um, who are often, you know, the ones that are that are, you know, completely discounted. Most people don't even realize there's an, almost almost a dozen native communities that still live. Uh, in this area, uh, and they're again, they're the ones who are, you know, completely feeling the impact of this. W w what it really is is an all-out war, an all-out assault on Mother Earth um, that they're going through and tearing down, you know, this forest. They're polluting the the, the rivers that were once some of the cleanest uh, in North America, and replacing it with a toxic moonscape. Um, these this this community in particular here. Um, has begun to, the, a lot of the hunters have begun to notice that their, their bodies are getting covered in rashes um, just from actually walking through regular, the, the, the muskeg, the, the sort of bog, uh, boggy areas that they do a lot of their hunting, their fishing, their trapping uh, still to this day. A lot of these communities are fairly remote, I might add as well. And so a lot of people actually still depend on to this day uh, hunting, trapping, fishing for a lot of their, their food sources. Uh, you know, especially uh, fishing, especially a lot of moose in the area, um, and so, you know, one of the, one of the you know other other things that, that people really tried to impress upon me when I was traveling there was that, you know, they used to be able to drink the water, you know, in their backyards in the in the Athabasca River, and it's gone from you know being the being able to do that about 30 years ago to, from, to that being one of the most polluted bodies of water, uh, probably in North America at this point. Um, where, you know, in this community in particular, Fort Mackay, which is surrounded by a number of these industrial plants, um, children are now being born with respiratory illnesses. 
um, just in a really extreme situation. I spent a few days there and, you know, I was already feeling nauseous. My, I was getting headaches. You sort of feel stuff in the back of your throat all the time. Um, and, you know, community members are expected to live like that um, every day in and day out. Traveling a little bit farther north, we visited the community of, of Lubicon Cree, and they had actually been recently impacted by a gigantic oil spill, um, second biggest oil spill ever in Canadian history. Uh, about a million gallons uh, had leaked into their backyards as well. And similar to a lot of the, the oil spills that we've been hearing about in the past few weeks, um, the community was only informed uh, about these spills um, you know, three or four days after they had happened, after people had, you know, already begun to, to get sick. Um, and then, you know, the, the company tried as best that they could to keep community members from actually seeing what had happened to their land. I just want to point out in this picture to, to really get a, an idea of the scale. Um, I think there's a, there's a little laser here. Um, right there is, is a full-size pickup truck. So these trucks around here are the biggest trucks on the planet. If you've ever seen the movie Avatar, they're kind of on that scale, holding about 400 tons of earth uh, in each one. And they operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, going and scraping down 100, 200, 300 feet of earth um, of what used to be you know, the, uh, pristine boreal forest. So this is, this is, this is you know, kind of what you see if you travel up to the area. Um, this is what, you know, development of uh, Earth's most ex extreme sort of forms of energy looks like up close. Traveling even farther north, we visit the community of, of Fort Chippewan, and they become famous as, as one of the most impacted communities, even though they're actually very far removed. They're about 200 miles away from the actual developments. Their community lies along Ath Lake Athabasca, the Athabasca River. And so, again, their community is one that's heavily dependent upon fishing and hunting and trapping. Being a fly-in community, there's no roads that, that go up to the community at all times. And um, right now, you know, what they're saying is that probably about 10% of the fish that they catch are deformed, have different growth spots on them, uh, have red blotches, have, you know, different little pus-filled areas on them. Um, some of them, they say they have tumors. Um, about 10% of the fish at this point. And what they're saying is that in the future, they expect you know, not to be able to eat or drink any, anything from, the, from the, the, the lake in about 10 years from now. And what this has meant for community members as well is that they're actually dealing with the impacts of, of uh, multiple cancer clusters in the area. Very rare cancers have been found in the community uh, at rates about 500% you know, more than, than they should be, uh, to the point where the average person living there has about a 30% chance of developing cancer over their lifetime. Uh, people as young as in their 20s are developing cancer these days, and this is a picture of a, a woman who survived uh, double breast cancer um, and you know, eventually decided that she had to move her family out of the community um, because she was too scared to raise her children and her grandchildren uh, there and expose them to those, those pollutants, which should be a choice that none of us have to make to abandon you know, our community, to abandon our roots. Uh, simply for you know the health of our, our children. Um, this is a picture of the chief uh, of the community, and you know he was really reticent about about you know becoming involved in politics, about becoming a, a chief, and what it, what it ended up pushing him into that was the fact that his his nephew, who was only in his 20s, uh, ended up getting cancer and, and passing away in the community. Um, who was a was a cousin of of of, of this man here, um, and so. You know, for a community only of just over a thousand people, every every single family has been um, touched by you know these sort of tragedies. Um, that you know, the, this and this development I should also mention is only about ten years old. It's only been in, in production for about the past ten years, um, in in a, in a very serious way. And so that um, just as in the Amazon, you know, uh, people are very much scared for their lives, um, very much concerned that you know. Uh, the unprecedented rate of, you know, development um, is going to basically create and render their, their communities uh, unlivable in the future. And so just as, just as with the Amazon as well, people have begun to, to resist that. People have begun to stand up and speak up. And so this is a, a picture um, from what's called the Healing Walk, which is uh, in its fourth year this year, a mixture of a protest as well as a prayer for Mother Earth that brings together a lot of these different communities who are, you know, 
spread out as far as you know three four hundred miles um, from each other and they they you know begun to participate and you know share experiences after they realized that they were all dealing with some of the same impacts even though they were you know so disconnected from each other um, and their the, the the stand that these communities have made has inspired a lot of other communities to get involved has inspired a lot of other communities to understand the impacts of the tar sands on those communities in Alberta, as well as push them to take action in, in their own territories to stop uh, development of related infrastructure, including pipelines, um, especially pipelines that are going to go across British Columbia, uh, one of the most pristine landscapes that we have and cross over about 50 different uh, native uh, territories over there. Um, as well as much more recently, uh, we have you know the plans for uh, pipelines going all the way across uh, Canada to the east, uh, another Enbridge pipeline, as well as of course the, the famous Keystone XL pipeline that um, you know is 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 being sought to, to develop and, and push oil from tar sands down into the United States, to which there's been a you know a tremendous amount of, of of resistance, tremendous amount of activism over the past little while. And so that's you know really inspired a lot of people and a lot of movements, social movements in Canada, um, to begin to get involved, to begin to really, you know, really take and understand this this issue seriously, and also to understand it from an indigenous rights perspective, as not just you know this, this sort of simple environmental problem, but as an environmental justice issue, as a moral issue, as a human rights issue as well. Um, and so we've had you know a tremendous amount of of support. Uh, in the past little while, and also communities coming together from the um, United States uh, and from Canada um, uh, trying to develop those linkages. And the other sort of efforts that it, it's really engendered have been a lot of legal strategies to try and, and stop and control the tar sands, relying on indigenous rights and law, which are slightly, different, uh, slightly differently applied in Canada than in the United States, um, but which, which, you know, in theory, uh, should allow for you know indigenous communities to have a right to 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 you know slow down or stop development in their territories, um, and so there's a number of you know really uh, potentially powerful uh, legal precedents that are that are going through the court right now that are testing the ability of of those indigenous communities' rights to say no. So those were two I think really. I think dis informative, really descriptive examples of you know what we're talking about the the, the resource neocolonialism that's impacting indigenous communities, not just in North America, not just in South America, but around the world, and are also prime factors in creating and causing climate change, um, and also make these communities a lot more susceptible to the impacts of climate change when it actually does come to their their communities. Um, I want to talk a bit about sea level rise. I'm not going to go super in-depth because I know we have a lot of other speakers that are going to touch on some more technical aspects here. Um, but I, I do want to preface, you know, what I'm saying is, is um, you know, talking about sea level rise, we have a lot of different ideas of what might happen um, in the future, uh, different um, forecasts from different uh, authorities on the subject matter. The IPCC, you know, famously reporting that um, potentially uh, one foot of sea level rise not taking into account uh, the melting of Greenland or the Antarctic ocean or the Antarctic uh, ice um, to more recent um, and much sort of uh, scarier predictions uh, including ones from James Hansen that say you know we can expect anything from two to five meters of sea level rise within this century uh, which is within the time frame of you know people who are who are alive today um, and you know, following these examples and, and looking at you know the fact that pretty much you know no countries on on the earth are really taking the, the issue of climate change seriously. It, it doesn't seem like you know we're 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 in a place that we can neglect the the extreme threat of, of sea level rise that that it goes beyond you know uh, one meter, two meters, and definitely um, you know potentially in the future. Uh, dozens of meters if climate change is not um, controlled. Uh, we might not be talking this century, but these are you know, things that, that, that we really should be uh, thinking about and dealing with. And so, you know, as, 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 as was mentioned uh, by Roberta, you know, we have a lot of indigenous peoples that, that live in a lot of these different coastal environments uh, around the world. Um, and, you know, a lot of indigenous peoples 
on this planet today tend to inhabit or have been forced into some of the most extreme environments that you know really exist on the planet, which also happen to be uh, biological biodiversity hotspots on this planet. So within you know the the areas that are inhabited by you know the five percent of the world's population that are represented by indigenous peoples, we have about ninety percent of the ethnic and, and cultural diversity, and about ninety percent of of the biodiversity on land um, represented in those areas. Um, and so for, for indigenous peoples, their economies and their cultures are, are intimately intertwined with uh, the biodiversity, the, the life um, that, that occurs in those areas. And I think you know, one of the most telling is uh, you know, the, the situation of indigenous peoples living in uh, island states and whose uh, culture is dependent on, on those islands. And you know, I understand we have some speakers there who are going to going to speak to that. But it bears mentioning that you know some of these islands are already beginning to uh, subside to climate change. We have storm surges that are wiping away communities in these areas. Some islands and island states will disappear completely within this century, and you know some of that that, that has already begun to happen. Others may have to be forced to relocate entirely, and you know what that really represents. Is, is really unfathomable. It's, it's a loss of an ethnogeography, it's a loss of an ecosystem, it's a loss of an entire culture that's entwined in those places. Um, for Arctic communities, which we're also going to hear about, sea level rise compounds with you know, a decline in the sea, uh, with, with the sea ice that sort of threatens a, a perfect storm in many ways of, of, of coastal surges, uh, coastal erosion uh, that threatens to push many of these communities into the sea at this point. Um, and then that gets compounded with uh, the loss of permafrost, which you know causes some of these communities to be in complete disarray um, uh, all around the Arctic. Um, and so, you know, what we're having right now is that you know there's already communities in Alaska, but also um, other places in the world. Uh, Russia doesn't get a lot of mention because they don't actually have the resources to do this. But you know, a lot of communities, a lot of, a lot of the indigenous Arctic communities in Russia, are dealing with you know very much the same thing. But you know, might be forced to live with entirely collapsing infrastructure for a number of years um, and might not have any sort of recourse at all. There's a number of other indigenous coastal communities that all face these challenges, and. Combined with uh, the loss of marine ecosystems on which they depend for food and their economy, the loss of some ecosystems entirely, changes in salinization levels, the salinization of groundwater, um, destruction of a lot of mangrove ecosystems across the world, uh, more powerful storms, more diseases coming to these communities. We have a lot of, of, of these different impacts of, of climate change all combining to threaten a lot of the world's uh, indigenous peoples that happen to live uh, on, 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 in coastal areas, uh, including communities all around the coast of the Americas. So these, 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 th these threats of climate change really represent a number of uh, particularly impacted, uh, particularly uh, amplified threats to indigenous peoples, including threats to their food security and sovereignty, as the animals and plants upon, upon which many indigenous peoples rely uh, lose their habitat or are forced to change uh, habitats entirely. Uh, threat, a real threat to water security as a threat of sea level rise causing salinization, the loss of culturally significant places, ceremonial sites, burial places, uh, traditional medicine grounds, basically you know, an irreplaceable amount of heritage uh, potentially being lost forever, and the ability to preserve and continue to teach a number of traditions, a lot of you know, our people's in, uh, traditional knowledge is tied up in an understanding of the land, of the water, of you know the, the the different environmental systems and how they function, and already a lot of that is being put into jeopardy by the inability to you know actually and correctly predict um, the, what what the ecosystems will do, what the weather patterns will do, what the climate will do on a long term scale. Um, so these these all culminate, I would I would argue, in, in a very serious threat to the you know human rights of indigenous peoples around the world. Uh, including the right to self-determination, which is you know, sometimes seen as less tangible, but I think ultimately very, very important to the future and then preservation of indigenous cultures around the world by removing indigenous peoples from collectively being able to take action. Now, I want to contrast this you know, portrayal of, of indigenous peoples and how they're impacted by climate change with the actual responses that indigenous peoples have, have been taking over the past number of years um, to, the, to climate change um, as an issue in the international fora. 
And so there, there are three different trends that I want to mention that were sort of brought up earlier. The responses by Indigenous uh, peoples to the dominant uh, politics and institutions that are dealing with climate change, the responses to what are often called the false solutions that are being uh, implemented and enforced around climate change, and of course the, the responses to what are identified as the true drivers of climate change, of which we've seen a few examples already. So just to give by way of a brief history of, of Indigenous involvement, uh, a lot of Indigenous involvement around the issue of climate change as climate change began um, in 1992 with the first Rio Earth Summit. Um, in which a number of indigenous communities from around the world participated and had played a strong part in, in, in really pushing countries to, to take uh, indigenous communities very seriously at that time. Um, indigenous participation with, within the climate change negotiations only picked up again almost a decade later in 2001 when indigenous peoples began regularly attending United Nations climate change negotiations. Uh, the official negotiations of the UNFCCC, um, and began to take a number of strong roles and active, and active roles in, in, in those negotiations as part of wider civil society involvement. And since getting involved, I would argue that Indigenous peoples have, have really been pushing for two things within the climate change negotiations in particular. One is for the strongest actions and responsibilities to be taken by particularly northern states to avoid the worst impacts of climate change from, from having to, to occur. And second, to gain recognition for indigenous peoples, indigenous rights, and indigenous worldviews within the climate change negotiations and, and framework. So in the first role, indigenous peoples have been playing an increasingly important role in pushing for the strongest possible actions by states and have actually become recognized leaders within civil society movements uh, in the UN. Uh, who are more increasingly adopting the messages of indigenous peoples um, and understanding who, who have taken on a, a very crucial moral position uh, to be one of the, the sort of strongest advocates against climate change um, and have really joined forces in the past number of years with women's groups, with farmers, uh, youth groups, trade groups, and a number of more progressive environmental and environmental justice groups to really form a, a really strong, really formidable coalition uh, of civil society groups around the world. In the second role, indigenous groups have also become adv advocates for redefining what climate change is. And that's, that's, it's, become, it's, it's less visible, but it's, 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 it's got a very important uh, a role. Because climate change, when it was first you know, brought under the United Nations system, was identified as a very sort of technical, very sort of um, even more economic issue uh, than you know, it's understood today. And that was how the United Nations started to deal with it from the outset and you know, issue things like uh, carbon credits and, and, and sort of tax schemes. But with the, you know, the involvement of, of indigenous peoples and a lot of other civil society group, it's become more, much more recognized, of course, as a human rights issue uh, to this day, as, and of course, as a very you know, serious political and moral issue. Um, and what that's actually sort of meant is that a lot of the indigenous uh, the rights of indigenous peoples language has actually been implemented in, in some of the United Nations negotiations. Not enough, you know, any of us would argue, but it's starting to become recognized. And that's, you know, an incredible precedent and, you know, has been recognized as a precedent by a lot of other groups who, who are seeking to, you know, protect their, their, their own human rights as well within the purvey of, of these climate change negotiations. And a lot of this work has come bec because of the forming of alliances with a number of more progressive states. Um, Bolivia, of course, being one of the, the strongest examples, but also a number of other Latin American, African, uh, and Asian states have, have, have actually stepped up to the plate, um, who were traditionally much more sort of, um, you know, not supportive of indigenous rights in the past. At the same time, um, indigenous groups have become increasingly critical of the United Nations process as they've seen it go down in flames, uh, epitomized by the Copenhagen you know, Climate Summit and the, the Copenhagen Accord. And so, of course, before the, the Copenhagen Summit, um, there was a, an indigenous gathering in Alaska, in Anchorage, uh, in 2009 that brought together a lot of the world's indigenous peoples to sort of come together and, and try and come up with you know, joint positions that, that they could sort of take into Copenhagen that they could take in advance beyond those meetings. And when a lot of that fell through, um, there was a widespread sort of rejection of you know, the United Nations system as perhaps the, you know, the body that was gonna lead these, these kind of things. 
um, Bolivia was taken, was given a, a strong role in organizing the Cochabamba Climate Summit uh, in 2010, which brought together about 30,000 indigenous peoples, primarily from um, the Andean regions of, of, of South America. And I think both of those, both of those um, meetings were really instructive because they identified very similar root causes of climate change and analysis of you know, what, what actual solutions would be. At the same time, it was becoming clear that indigenous peoples or somebody had to speak up about some of the solutions that were actually being proposed within the United Nations systems to climate change um, as they were identified as having you know, potentially really negative results, not just on indigenous peoples, but on the planet as a whole. Um, a prime concern has been a focus on carbon credits uh, by the United Nations system, which has been seen as a way for companies to basically continue to pollute, implementing at best ineffective you know, methods of, of mitigating their, their, their you know, pollution in other places in the world. At worst, coming up with really destructive um, plans that they push and implement on other countries and other cultures. And some of these, some of these that we've actually seen go through and that are having you know, negative impacts on indigenous peoples to this day include mega dams that have been uh, uh, pushed on different populations and have uh, forced different communities to be displaced entirely. Uh, renewables, uh, you know, so-called renewables being, uh, other renewables being imposed on uh, other communities, a variety of forest-related protection schemes uh, that have sometimes criminalized or displaced indigenous peoples from the forests in which they live and depend upon, um, nuclear power um, and clean coal being very heavily advocated for, of course, by uh, industries and a number of different governments who are, you know, keen to, to, to not actually take any action on climate change. You have the really crazy ones um, being proposed, and, and you know some of these have actually uh, companies are starting to test these out in, in small scales, where they're actually trying to seed and create algae blooms in the ocean, for example, or seed the skies with uh, different chemicals to, to create cloud cover and, and you know reflect some of the light. Um, we've also seen the widespread pushing and the development of biofuels, palm plantations, other monocrop plantations. Uh, particularly across the global south, um, and you know, impacting on a lot of indigenous territories uh, in, in their kind of implementation. And so, instead, you know, what indigenous communities have been saying is that you know, these are all false solutions. These are all false paths on which you know we can't really rely. And the worst excesses of climate change can only be avoided if we radically reorient our society begin to decolonize you know, our minds, our politics, our institutions, and work to renew and revitalize relationships with Mother Earth and with each other as human beings. And I think looking at you know, some of the examples, you know, going back from Bagua in the Amazon and a number of other um, indigenous communities all over the Amazon to this day, to Alberta, uh, looking at the examples in British Columbia amongst different First Nations that are opposing the uh, Enbridge pipeline uh, and a number of other pipelines that are going out there um, to across the United States right now, we see that Indigenous nations are again retaking a front and center space in the public and leading in a lot of ways uh, a role for to stand up and, and defend Mother Earth. And I think we're at a really powerful moment at this current time um, in Canada, we've seen a lot of really strong actions over the past number of years that Indigenous communities have been doing to, 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 to stand up and, and defend Mother Earth. I know that's true in the United States as well. Um, and much more recently with you know, the concern over the expansion of the tar sands gaining a lot of traction within Canada, within the United States, within even in international, uh, international circles. Uh, we also had the culmination of uh, concern in Canada, at least with the, the Idle No More movement. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with that one, but uh, began basically in December with a series of you know, what were meant to be educational uh, sort of uh, events that ended up inspiring tens of thousands of Native people in, in Canada to sort of organize and, and get active, and uh, many youth to, to get involved and active uh, often for the first time. Um, in their own communities. And that actually inspired, and there's pictures later um, from what was called the Nishio Walkers, uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the many offsets of, of the I Don't Know More movement, uh, which inspired a group of, of youth from northern Quebec to walk about 1,000 miles over a period of 60 days in the wintertime, about minus 30 degree temperatures, 
same Fahrenheit as Celsius, uh, to arrive in Ottawa, where they were stubbed by our prime minister, who chose instead to do a photo op with a bunch of pandas. Anyway. <laughs> Um, the, it's, it's really represented a, a really strong resurgence of, of indigenous movements, of indigenous uh, uh, peoples getting together, um, you know, also across the borders, as, as a lot of uh, indigenous communities in the United States as well, as well have come together and, and have started coming together to try and stop the expansion of, of Keystone XL pipelines and a number of other destructive um, projects throughout the U.S. And I think, you know, what's, what's really, um, what also really has to be kept in mind around, you know, particularly the opposition to the Keystone XL pipelines, in the past few weeks we've seen a lot of, a lot of uh, more media coverage than ever before around some of these other pipelines that have been spilling all across the United States um, and Canada. And you know what's what's really important to keep in mind, with, especially with the Keystone XL, is even if these pipelines work perfectly, even if there's never, you know, anything that that, that goes wrong with them, they should still be in, in, unacceptable. They should still be recognized for continuing, you know, to commit these environmental crimes against indigenous communities. In this case, in Alberta, and you know, with the export of this oil, with the protection of this oil, you know, the continuation of climate change, uh, you know, impacts to indigenous communities and other communities across this planet. So I want to close by, by sort of really noting that, you know, it's really powerful, really interesting time, you know, to be here, to be talking about these issues, to see a lot of not just native nations come together with each other and, and support and really stand together, but also a lot of non-native groups also coming in and waking up to a lot of the responsibilities that they have as well. And it's powerful to note, I think, that we're recognizing, we're starting to recognize this, you know, not just as an environmental, not just as a very technical issue, but as a very profound uh, political, moral, economic, and human rights issue that impacts us all, that we're all, you know, in many ways uh, complicit, implicit, um, and involved within. And that will, it's one of those issues that will come to really define our time, um, perhaps even our species in the future. Some of my photos in there um, are part of a, a photo documentary series um, that's been produced by a group that's actually based here in California and as well as in Peru called Conversations with the Earth. Um, and uh, I think I have their website eventually as well. Um, but the, you know, it's one example of, of one of the, the projects that we've done is, is gone across to a number of different indigenous communities uh, around the planet and actually try and document, you know, just how indigenous communities are being impacted in, this, in, that, in that specific case uh, by climate change. And we've had a tremendous um, level of support. That one actually uh, was featured in the Smithsonian for a number of months, uh, has gone on tour in, in different parts of, of the United States, uh, a little bit in, in South America as well. Um, but I think as part of a, a more broader trend, it, it really represents as well a, a you know, really burgeoning time where we're starting to real, realize and recognize um, the power and the importance of allowing indigenous communities to, you know, almost in many cases for the first time, speak for themselves. Um, and that's a lot of that's come from, you know, a lot of training, a lot of education um, that a lot of our young people uh, have been, you know, getting, getting access to over the past number of time, years. Um, you know, I consider myself very lucky in that regard. Uh, you know, no, though not formally trained uh, as a photographer, I've you know, kind of fell into that role as, through my involvement, through my participation with uh, a number of these different organizations and, and you know, uh, working with a number of these different communities over the past years uh, that, you know, I, I sort of accepted and took that on as, as, as a, you know, responsibility myself. But, you know, starting to see that, that, you know, our peoples are starting to train themselves in media, in social media, and communications. We have a lot of really amazing, really talented uh, indigenous photographers, uh, as well as filmmakers these days who are, you know, doing their best to, to actually work and, and, and really tell our stories. And I think that that is, is something that we definitely really have to be focused on, um, as well as looking at, you know, the, the the two, the sort of dichotomy of, of, of you know, the, the, the media, the, you know, the mainstream media and the, and the alternative media. Um, I think, we, you know, it's been really useful um, that a lot of our peoples have been expanding into, you know, the realms of alternative media. We have our own blogs, we have our own websites, we, you know, publish our own, there's India, sorry, Indian Country Today um, does a really, you know, powerful service for that. 
um, where we're able to get a lot of our own stories out in a lot of, in our own words. And at the same time, there has been a lot of work done to sensitize, to sensibilize the you know mainstream media on native issues. Of course, you know uh, it's nowhere near where it needs to be. Um, you know, I think they they still don't take a lot of our issues very seriously, or you know, um, very look at them very in a very in depth way, uh, as many of us would like them to. But I think that that that's that's you know. That, along with the role of education, um, starting in schools, you know, making sure that that kind of thing reaches out, that you know, children have an actual decent education, decent understanding of you know who Native people are, that you know we still exist. We didn't just you know disappear in the 1800s into the walk into the sunset and say, hey, that was great. You know, have this. Go ahead, have the country now. We're just gonna <laughs> we're just gonna disappear. But understanding, you know, the the the, the actual. Uh, current lived experiences and history of, of Native people, I think uh, all those little things are, are, are definitely necessary uh, pieces to, to really construct a, a more representative media experience, a more representative, you know, public experience, public sort of profile of Indigenous peoples that will actually allow us to understand and, and, and uh, empathize with, you know, Indigenous experiences here, not just in North America, but of course with, you know, Indigenous communities across the world um, and, you know, other uh, impacted peoples who are, you know, affected by uh, the things that we do, the things, the actions that we do, the, you know, the policies and, and actions of our governments as well. Uh, I think that, you know, only with time, only with a lot more, you know, uh, action on that front are we actually going to have, you know, the ability to, to, to bring our peoples together and, and you know, uh, ensure that that kind of respect is, is, is in, you know, not just in the media, but, you know, in widespread society, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and obviously this is an incredibly complex uh, set of issues and we can't possibly go into really give it the, the time and um, attention that it needs to fully develop. Um, I realize we're um, coming right up to the break time, so I want to um, allow students who need to go to a class to go ahead and uh, transition, but if we could have, uh, if anyone in the audience has a question that they are um, really uh, interested in asking or posing right now, I'd like to open it up for audience questions, um, if anyone wants to further this conversation. John? Thanks, hi Ben, uh, John Thanks. Foran. I talked to you in Durban a couple years ago. Yeah. That was the interview I did that got erased somehow, and I'm devastated by that. So I do have a question. <laughs> uh, and it's really asked you to update uh, us on how you see the global climate justice movement hmm. developing, and particularly the youth component, which I've become quite impressed by. Yeah. So I think, I think what's been really powerful, really incredible over the past few years has been the, you know, the creation of, of you know, global climate justice movement um, with actual strong, strong participation of a number of, of, of U.S. groups, North American-based groups and European groups, um, has really been, I think, uh, one of the more sort of hopeful things that, that we could possibly see. Of course, there's not, there's not been you know, the, the, the necessary sort of you know, action and, and follow-up here in the U.S., which is what, what really needs to happen. But with the rise of this, this sort of global climate justice movement over the past number of years, um, they've really f taken a strong space within climate change negotiations as well as outside of climate change negotiations um, to give a voice to a lot of the most impacted communities to really try and, and hold a lot of states accountable and you know, push them to, to take the most responsibilities possible. Um, but they've also gone and above and beyond that in creating you know, alternative spaces uh, outside of just the formal negotiation spaces. Um, and you know, that's, that's become really, really uh, necessary and really uh, often some of the most powerful spaces uh, if you, you know, if, 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 if you know, you're actually at some of these United Nations negotiations, um, a, not a lot, of, not a lot of, you know, things are are very possible within the negotiations themselves. Um, you know, you can make a statement uh, as civil society group, um, maybe a total of uh, ten times. You know, as uh, all of civil society gets about ten opportunities uh, to make statements during the entire negotiations, and apart from that, you know, there's very little um, sort of allowed. 
uh, participation uh, from you know representatives of, of all these different peoples around the world. And so uh, I think the global climate justice movement has been really powerful in, in trying to bring a lot of these groups together, um, trying to you know get us to know one another. Um, and I think that that's, that's, that's really formed a lot of really strong links and, and a lot of strong solidarity. And particularly, I do want to you know, also mention that a number of the youth groups um, have been doing really powerful work in that way as well. Um, when we first got, in, when I, at least when I first got involved in, in international climate change negotiations, a lot of the youth groups were there were, you know, very um, cheerful, very sort of positive, and you know, doing the kind of like, yeah, youth want to fight climate change, and it, they were very good, you know, they had very good sort of intentions and, and everything, but they didn't necessarily have a lot of the analysis, a lot of the, the understanding of, 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 you know, how complex these issues sometimes were, and. You know, especially one of the, the, the main troubles with, uh, or the main, one of the main challenges with doing a lot of youth work is there's an incredible amount of turnover. You know, people eventually stop becoming youth uh, <laughs> somehow, which isn't necessarily true for a lot of the other sort of, you know, social movements, you know. Um, and so there's a, there's, there's, there's a constant amount of work that's needed to, you know, bring people in, to get them up to speed, to, to educate them. And uh, I think it's really through you know a lot of uh, dedicated um, groups out there that we've, we've been able to see in the past few years a really strong uh, youth actions within United, Neg United Nations negotiations. Um, a lot of youth have actually you know stood up and, and actually in many cases got themselves kicked out um, for taking the strong stances that they have in solidarity with indigenous groups, with island states, uh, with African states uh, in Durban. Um, it's been really, really powerful to actually see that. And I think that that, uh, in many ways alone, inspires a lot of other groups, inspires even some of the states. You know, we've actually seen some of the, you know, representatives, members of, of um, different, different countries come out and, you know, just be in tears, just be really touched by um, just how far the young people are, are willing to go. And I mean, you know, the, the, whole, the range of that is very, you know, varies incredibly, but, you know, sometimes we have people as young as, as you know, 9, 10, 11 participating in some of these negotiations and, you know, to hear, a, you know, a 10-year-old get up and, and give a speech, you know, there's, there's usually not a dry eye left in the auditorium afterwards. It, and so there's, there's a lot of real, you know, powerful uh, uh, space that I think uh, our young people are, are starting to, 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 to take up um, and, you know, demand for themselves within these negotiations. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, a trend that can only, you know, continue and, and get stronger. Thank you so much. Um, I want to allow people to have time for a quick break before our next session, so I think we should uh, give Ben our thanks once again for his fantastic presentation. Thank you all for coming.